Care and Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Gutting Hill Herald Podcast, recorded at the Bishop Wright's Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Care and Review. That is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-E-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-E-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling 0141 772 3976 That's 0141-772-3976. This podcast was created on Wednesday the 18th of October 2023 and is read to you by volunteers Alan, Hunter, Ian and Rebecca. Brute jailed over abuse. A man has been jailed for two years after he admitted abusive behaviour towards four women, including one in Kirkintilloch. Kieran Graham assaulted one of the females when she was pregnant, aired the Sheriff Court heard this week. Graham, 24, pleaded guilty to a string of charges relating to incidents between September 2017 and September last year. He also admitted headbutting and punching a teenage girl at a house in Kilsyth in 2016 when he was aged 16. The court heard Graham attacked one partner at a house in Fisher Avenue, Kilsyth, including when she was pregnant. On one occasion, he was carrying out a knife and her hand was cut during the struggle. She lost consciousness on two occasions, when Graham restricted her breathing, once after he put a pillow over her head. Graham was abusive towards his second partner at addresses in Hillside, Croy and Salford Place, Kirkintilloch, over a four-month period, shouting at her repeatedly and controlling her contact with friends he showed similar controlling behaviour towards another woman with, when with her at a house in Livingston, West Lothian. He punched and kicked her, throttled her and, on more than one occasion, locked her in the house. The final victim was subjected to verbal abuse and threats of violence at an address in Bedencloy Crescent, Lennox Town, over a four-month period last year. Graham would grab her phone and check messages, prevent her from going shopping and listening in on our private conversations with family members. Defence agent Jim Sloan said, Graham had endured a difficult childhood, and much of his offending happened when he was under the influence of alcohol. The solicitor added, He has been in prison awaiting this case. It's his first taste of custody, and he certainly hasn't taken to it. He hopes to put all of this behind him, get some kind of employment, and stay away from alcohol when he's eventually released. Passing sentence, Sheriff Paul Haran said it was a very serious course of, of abusive con- conduct but he had to consider that the offending started when Graham was only 16 and he had showed a degree of immaturity. The Sheriff jailed him for two years, reduced from three years because of his guilty pleas and backdated to December the 2nd last year. Graham will be under supervision for a year after his release to reduce the risk of reoffending and, and offer him support. Non-harassment orders were imposed in relation to the four women, meaning he is banned from having any contact with them for three years. This Week in History, read by me, Ian. October 19, 1862. Auguste Lumiere, French moving picture pioneer, was born. His cinematography system gave its name to the word cinema. On this day last year, Inflation rose to 10.1%, making it the second time the rate had reached double digits so far that year. October the 20th, 1822. Thomas Hughes, author of Tom Brown's School Days, was born in Uffington, Berkshire. On this day last year, Liz Trust announced her resignation, making her the shortest serving Prime Minister in history. October 21st, 1966, disaster struck the small Welsh mining village of Aberfan when a colliery slag, tip, 
slid down the side of a hill and engulfed a row of houses, a farm and a school. Of the 144 people who died, 116 were children. On this day last year, maternity services in England deteriorated to their lowest level, the hospital's regulator said, as it expressed deep concerns about the quality of care given to mothers and babies. October 22, 1974, a bomb exploded in Brooks Club in London, near a restaurant where the opposition leader at the time, Edward Heath, was dining. On this day last year, fiber for optic laser, laser therapy, which could transform the lives of people with heart to cheap epilepsy, was rolled out across the NHS. October 23, 1844, the Divine Sarah, actress Sarah Bernhardt, was born in Paris. A place to stay warm. It's hoped there will be a warm welcome for the latest campaign to help keep people connected and cosy during the winter months. Eastern Bartonshire Council has launched Winter Connections, a programme offering funding, support and information. It is coordinating and supporting a network of local places and spaces where people can attend events, try activities and meet up with others as the nights grow long and the wind turns icy. Funding applications are being invited from not-for-profit, voluntary and community organisations and venues with grants of up to £1,500 available to help cover additional costs and asso- costs associated, associated <laughs> with individual projects. Applications will be accepted until all the available funding has been allocated. To apply or find out more information, including guidance and eligibility, visit the Eastern Bartonshire Government website. Councillor Gordon Lowe, leader of Eastern Bartonshire Council, said, Living costs continue to be a challenge for everyone, so it is vital that we do all we can, working with our partners, to ease the burden as much as possible. That's why the Council is providing an additional package of support worth over £1.9 million following the £2.1 million which was allocated in 2022. We want Winter Connections activities and venues to be available in every community in Eastern Bartonshire, at a range of times and for residents of all ages. We would particularly welcome applications for projects which will be available during the festive period. As well as funding, we aim to provide the latest information on what is taking place in local areas via our website and social media channels. The Council can help to connect venues with groups who can offer activities and vice versa. Grant funding must be spent by the end of March 2024. Applications will be reviewed on a rolling basis by representatives from the Council, Eastern Bartonshire Health and Social Care Partnership and Eastern Bartonshire Voluntary Action. Visit the Council's website for more information and a link to the online application form. Read by Alan Todd. Fair relief welcomed, as recorded by Hunter MacDonald. SNP MSP Rona Mackay has welcomed the scrapping of peak fares across ScotRail services for the next six months. The trial will see the end of peak fares on all ScotRail services at all times until March 2024 and is funded by the SNP Scottish Government. The cost of peak time travel on some of Scotland's busiest routes is expected to reduce by as much as 48%. Rona said it's fantastic to see the Scottish Government investment deliver the scrapping of peak fare services for the next six months. This trial, backed by £15 million of the SNP Scottish Government funding, will make our rail services more accessible and encourage active travel, benefiting the health and well-being of the communities, like my constituency, and advancing progress towards our ambitious net zero goals. Charity praised by local MSP A Kirkintilla charity striving to ensure disabled people and those with chronic conditions have the opportunity of a fulfilling working life has been praised by the local MSP. Rona Mackay paid a visit to the Scottish Union of Supported Employment, SUSE, at Neesham Drive to learn more about their work recently. The aim of SUSE 
is to support disabled people to find and retain paid work by increasing the availability and quality of supported employment in Scotland. Next month, SUSE is hosting Inclusive Employers Week Scotland, a week of activities from November the 13th to 17th, to help employers discover more about the support available to them to recruit and retain disabled talent. Local firms can take part in a week of bite-sized online information sessions and training. Rona said it was fantastic to visit the SUSE to hear about its vital work promoting inclusion and diversity in the workforce. It's so important disabled people and those with long-term health conditions have the opportunity of a fulfilling working life. SUAC was shortlisted this year for the Digital Citizen Award at the SCVO Scottish Charity Awards 2023. To find out more on the work of SUAC, visit suac.org.uk. Now is the time to sort your will. Money-saving expert Martin Lewis is urging residents in Eastern Partonshire to write a will to protect their family's assets and inheritance during this year's annual Will Aid campaign. During the current cost of living crisis, the annual Will Aid campaign, which sees solicitors across the UK volunteering their time to write wills throughout November, represents a great opportunity to tick writing your will off your to-do list and ensure your family's future is protected. November is Will Aid's annual UK-wide fundraising campaign involving nine of the UK's leading charities that share the proceeds ActionAid, Aid UK, British Red Cross, Christian Aid, NSPCC, Save the Children, Sight Savers, CAF, Scotland, and Troycare, Northern Ireland. Will Aid is open and appointments are now available. Like previous years, there is expected to be a high demand, so people are encouraged to book an appointment now with a participating solicitor, which they can find via the Will Aid website. Speaking on his podcast, Martin Lewis said, Will Aid is happening in November and open to anyone over the age of 18. Places do go quickly, so if you want an appointment, I suggest you book one as soon as possible. With Will Aid, over 400 solicitor firms across the country take part in the hope that you will make a charitable donation. Will Aid has been running since 1988 and is open to all adults. The suggested voluntary donation is £100 for a single will and £180 for a pair of mirror wills. Santa Dash. Ho, ho, ho. Registration is open for this year's iconic Glasgow Santa Dash. Get your festive celebrations underway in style by raising money for your chosen charity while having fun with friends, family or colleagues. Individuals, clubs and charities are invited to register for the much-loved fundraising event which will return to the city on Sunday, December the 10th at 10am. Last year there was a carnival atmosphere when almost 4,000 runners, young and old, dressed as Santa, elves and even a dinosaur, took to the new 5k route, some with prams and dogs in tow. Anyone keen to raise sponsorship for the Lord Provost Charity Fund can do so via the Just Giving page. Register to take part in the Santa Dash at www.glasgow.gov.uk forward slash Santa Dash. Entry £16 per adult and £6 per child under 16. Concert funds for hospice. Last Sunday's concert in Milton of Campsie Parish Church by Strathcarran Singers was well received and brought in £807 plus gift aid for the work work of the hospice. Along with their young and spirited director Matthew Brown and his dad David on the piano, 36 members of the choir delighted the audience. A selection of songs from Wales, Ireland, England and Scotland went down a treat, along with beautiful solos and duets too not to mention guest cellist Magnus Holden from Falkirk, who won the hearts of everyone. This was the choir's first visit to Milton of Campsie. The splendid tea for everyone after the concert was voted a real winner too. Local Wood shortlisted. 
Fantastic work which has transformed Cairn Hill Woods in Westerton has now been shortlisted for an award at RSPB Scotland's prestigious Nature of Scotland's Awards. Cairn Hill Woods project was announced as a finalist in the Community Initiative Award at the Nature of Scotland Award shortlist reception at the Scottish Parliament, hosted recently by Colin Smith, MSP and sponsored by Beam Suntory. Chairperson Paul Housley of Cairn Hill Woods Group said, It is an honour to be recognised in this way and I'm really proud to be part of a wonderful group of volunteers who have given their time over the years to improve this much-loved local green space from clearing drainage ditches, removing invasive rhododendron and putting up bird boxes. Cairn Hill Woods is enjoyed by so many people, be it dog walkers, school groups and even commuters, passing through. Everyone feels better after spending time here. We look forward to continuing the work with Eastern Bartonshire Council to make Cairn Hill Woods as welcome for people and wildlife as possible, now and in the future, and hope that the Nature of Scotland Awards shortlisting will raise awareness and encourage others to join us. Councillor Paul Ferretti, convener of the Council's Place, Neighbourhood and Corporate Assets Committee, said, Eastern Battenshire Council has been working with Cairn Hill Woods Group to improve this beautiful woodland as part of a long-standing partnership. We are absolutely delighted that the work has taken place here, led by the group and supported by the Council, has had, and has such a transformative effect on the area. This is a great example of how local authorities and volunteer groups can work together to transform our environment for the better betterment of our local communities. Cairn Hill Woods was officially designated as a local nature conservation site, LNCS, and extends to over 26 acres. The park is a well-used mixed woodland and is home to trees such as oak, beech and sweet chestnut and forms an important wildlife corridor which attracts birds such as the greater spotted woodpecker, nuthatch and bullfinch. A substantial upgrade of the paths network at Cairn Hill Woods recently has made the popular site even more user-friendly. Full Fibre is now online. More than 20,000 homes and businesses across the eastern Bartonshire are among one million in Scotland that can now access ultra-fast broadband on OpenReach's national network. The new full fibre services are now available to thousands of households and businesses in places like Bears Den and Balmore, while the rollout is expected to reach more Bishop Briggs properties in the next few months. Lennox Town has the highest level of coverage in eastern Bartonshire, with more than 8 out of every 10 properties able to upgrade to full fibre. Openreach has invested more than £6 million in eastern Bartonshire's new network so far and is working with the Scottish and UK governments through the Reaching 100% R100 programme and voucher schemes to upgrade some of its hardest to reach places. Local people can visit openreach.co.uk forward slash ultrafast full fibre to register for updates and check their postcode to see if and when services are available from their chosen provider. Robert Thorburn, Openreach Partnership Director for Scotland, said, Our engineers and build partners have done an amazing job helping us bring full fibre to one million homes and businesses across Scotland. Local people are using more and more data every year, streaming their favourite shows, downloading the latest video games and shopping and trading online. Bringing fibre broadband to places like Bishop Briggs and Bears Den allows locals to enjoy all the benefits of ultra-fast speeds now and will meet their data demands decades into the future. The new network is not just faster, but also more reliable, he added. We've more to do and we're working closely with Eastern Bartonshire Council to overcome challenges and reach as many homes and businesses as possible. The Scottish Government's 
Innovation Minister Richard Lockhead said, This is an important milestone in the drive to ensure more homes and businesses across Scotland, including here in eastern Bartlesher, benefit from full fibre broadband, improving vital connectivity. Hope lies with you immunotherapy. A young man who broke his arm after a horrific fall on New Year's Day was hit with a devastating cancer blow. Sean Atwal was walking back to his home in Lindsay after meeting a friend when he slipped on an icy street. He went for an x-ray at Newstop Hill Hospital, which confirmed that he had broken his upper arm. Medics carried out further tests and examinations, which revealed that 27-year-old had osteoscleroma, a rare form of bone cancer which typically affects children, adolescents and young adults. The cancer started in his arm before spreading to his lungs. At the time, he was 25 and worked at a call centre, which he was forced to leave due to ill health. Sean was referred to the Beetson Clinic, where he underwent chemotherapy and a 12-hour long operation to remove the cancerous bone, which was replaced with metal. He was put on another round of chemo after the surgery. His sister, Loveleen, has spoken of her family's devastation when her little brother was diagnosed. She said, We were shocked. It's not something we expected he'd be diagnosed with from a broken arm. No one in our family has had, has had cancer before and their lives changed. He was in hospital, not able to see his friends or go out. His social life took a massive hit. Loveline says that Sean sailed through the first year of treatment and was in remission for seven months. The brother and sister duo, who have a close bond, even went on a holiday to Portugal together when Sean began experiencing pain in his back. He went for a scan when he returned home and was given the news that his cancer had come back. This time it had spread to his spine, requiring surgery and radiotherapy treatment and is now undergoing chemotherapy. Doctors have said the cancer is no longer curable and can only be treated. This recent chemo is to keep things stable so that they can treat it. They can't cure it. Now, Sean's family have found alternative immunotherapy treatment in Japan, which they hope will help give him the best possible chance to be free of this disease. A GoFundMe page has already raised over £42,000. Caring for pets. Halloween is often a time of the year that families look forward to. Many people overlook that it can be a very stressful time for pets, not only the disguised stranger showing up to their home, but also the increased chance of eating highly toxic chocolate and sweets. Planning in advance is always best and can help limit stress, whether it's ensuring pets have their own safe space or activities, treats, to keep them preoccupied. There are many ways you can prepare your pets and make sure this Halloween is a treat for them just as much as us humans. An overlooked stressful scenario which seems harmless is dressing up your pet. Take time to think how they feel. Some may not mind it, but for many, costumes can be constricting and alter their core body temperature as well. New homes underway. Construction has started on the development of nine new homes at Berry Newell Avenue, Christon, North Lanarkshire. The affordable homes are being constructed by Morris and Spottiswood and include a bungalow and eight two-storey houses, helping provide much-needed high-quality affordable housing to the area. The new homes, which have a Scottish Government funding contribution of £1.3 million, is the first development in North Lanarkshire built by Caledonia Housing Association, who also have homes across Dundee, Perth and Kinross, Highland, Angus, Western Bartonshire, Eastern Bartonshire and Fife. Andrew Kilpatrick, Director of Assets, Caledonia House Association, said, Today marks a significant milestone for Caledonia in North Lanarkshire and we're really excited to see the work begin on site at Berrino Avenue. Throughout the planning application stage, we were really focused on ensuring this was a collaborative effort and worked closely with the local community to address any concerns they had. As well as building and managing quality homes for our tenants, Caledonia is also focused on building partnerships and we will be speaking with groups in the area to help design the planting around the new development, ensuring it works for the community and the people who live there. Pam Humphreys, Chief Officer of Place at North Lanarkshire Council said, 
It's always pleasing to see new housing developments planned for North Lanarkshire, and I'm delighted that new homes for rent are now on site and being built in Creston by Caledonian Housing Association. New projects like this one, being delivered by our housing association partners, complement our own housing ambitions to deliver 5,000 new homes by 2035 across North Lanarkshire. We look forward to the development's progression, which also contributes to a shared ambition of delivering quality housing to meet the needs of our local communities. Brian Pettigrew, director at Morris and Spottiswood, said, We are extremely excited to be working with the team at Caledonia Housing Association. This is our first project together. MSP applauds rail fares. Strathkelvin and Bearsden SNP MSP Rona Mackay has welcomed the scrapping of peak fares across Scotland's ScotRail services for the next six months. The trial will see the end of peak fares on all ScotRail services at all times until March 2024 and is funded by the SNP Scottish Government. The cost of peak time travelling on some of Scotland's business business routes, such as Glasgow to Edinburgh, is expected to be reduced by as much as 48%. Ms Mackay said, It is fantastic to see Scottish Government investment deliver the the scrapping of peak fares on publicly owned ScotRail services for the next six months. This trial, backed by £15 million of SNP Scottish Government funding, will make our rail services more accessible and encourage active travel, benefiting the the health and well-being of communities like my constituency and advancing progress towards our ambitious net zero goals. As the Tory-made cost of living crisis piles pressure on household budgets, the SNP Scottish Government is taking action to ease the burden. Communities to pitch. Nominations for a national park. Communities and organisations are being invited to submit their proposals to become Scotland's next national park. A key commitment in the Butte House Agreement is to designate at least one new national park in Scotland by 2026 to bring positive benefits for the environment and economy across the country. For the first time, nominations for a new park will be driven entirely by local communities and organisations and all areas of Scotland are eligible to to submit proposals. To meet the criteria, groups must be able to demonstrate, among other factors, outstanding national importance due to natural or cultural heritage, a distinctive character and coherent identity, how national park status would meet, would meet the specific needs of the area, evidence of local support for the proposal. Detailed guidance has been published and support will be available for any group looking to explore or take forward a proposal. The deadline for submissions is February 29th, 2024. Lorna Slater, Minister for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity, said, Scotland's national parks are among our greatest assets. They are home to internationally renowned landscapes and nature and provide outstanding opportunities for recreation in local communities. They also play a crucial role in tackling climate change and protecting our precious natural environment for future generations. Now is the time to add to them. We believe that a new national park should be founded upon local community demand, which is why we are launching this unique nominations process. In May, we invited early expressions of interest and we have already had a really positive response from the communities and organisations, the length and breadth of the country. This is not at all surprising given just how much Scotland has to offer. I encourage everyone that is considering putting forward the proposal to read the guidance that we have published on the Scottish Government website and get in touch to find out about the support available. Areas that have submitted early expressions of interest in becoming national parks include Galway, the Scottish Borders, Tay Forest, Loch Arbor, Island of Keogh, Sky and Rassi, Afric to Aladale, Glen Afric, Lammer Moors, Largo Bay and Loch Awe. In spring 2024, all nominations will be appraised against the criteria set out in the appraisal framework. 
This will inform the decisions of which area or areas should go forward for designation as a new national park. In summer 2024, Nature Scott will carry out a detailed investigation into the area or areas selected to become a new national park. Based on the outcome of that investigation, legislation is expected to be brought forward to order, in order to designate at least one new national park by 2026. Advice is available. The Scottish Government is committed to desi- designating at least one new national park in Scotland by the end of this parliamentary session in 2026. While some areas have already shown an interest in the proposal, community groups across the country are now being asked to share their views. To access the guidance, visit www.gov.scot slash publications slash new hyphen national hyphen parks hyphen nominations hyphen guidance hyphen appraisal hyphen framework to find out more about the process or seek advice visit www.gov.scot slash policies slash landscape hyphen and hyphen outdoor hyphen access hyphen national hyphen parks the deadline for nominations is February the 29th, 2024, so please meet your bids by then. GP Out of Hours service has been well received. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is seeking views on its delivery of GP Out of Hours to inform the development of the service. With extensive patient involvement, NHS GGC that is NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, has moved to a more stable appointment-based model of delivering GP out of hours since 2020. This change has resulted in a reduction of waiting times, fewer unplanned closures of sites and a high degree of satisfaction from those accessing the services. Recent engagement figures show that 93% of those who have accessed the service said it met with their needs from 83% in 2021. As NHS GGC seeks to create a long-term, robust and sustainable out-of-hours model which meets the needs of patients now and in the future, NHS GGC is now seeking feedback from patients and the public on the future model for the service. In agreement with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, a period of engagement with patients and the public is launched today, 9th of October 2023, with anyone who has a recent experience of accessing the GP out of our service and members of the public are invited to fill in the online survey. Available here, www.nhsggc dot scott forward slash g p o o h forward slash engagement Alan Stevenson Interim Director Primary Care and GP Out of Hours for NHS GGC said GP Out of Hours has undergone significant changes since the start of the pandemic, with all patients being channeled through NHS 24 as a first point of contact. We can ensure that people are directed to the most appropriate type of care. We have heard so many positive stories from those accessing GP Out of Hours, and we want to continue to engage to ensure patient voices and experiences are heard as we look to make this a permanent approach. In addition to having access to scheduled appointments where clinically appropriate, patients may also be offered telephone and virtual video consultations with GPs, therefore giving them more access to health care without necessarily having to travel to an out-of-hours urgent primary care centre. The period of engagement will last from October the 9th until December the 11th. In addition, NHS GGC will also be hosting a series of public events. First meeting held. Bishop Rice Community Council have held their first meeting following the summer recess. The organisation warmly welcomed representatives from one of the local primary schools 
Thomas Muir Primary School Primary Youth Ambassadors to their inaugural meeting after their recent break. Council leader, Councillor Gordon Lowe, gave an interesting speech before the ambassadors spoke about their primary school, how it was living in Bishop Briggs and being part of a wider community in Eastern Bartonshire. Councillor Lowe then presented all the pupils with their certificates. If you would like to find out more about Bishop Briggs Community Council, you can contact them via email. Alternatively, head on over to their social media on Facebook. Council needs your budget ideas. The Council has launched its Your Budget Priorities consultation ahead of its meeting earlier next year to agree the 2024-2025 budget. Each year, the Council must set a balanced budget and, in recent years, this has become increasingly difficult. One of the biggest challenges is that the cost of delivering services and the demand for those services have both increased, while funding levels have not risen to meet these pressures. The cost of ensuring that these services continue to be provided for residents in Eastern Partnership each year is approximately £322 million, and current predictions suggest that the funding gap for 2024-25 is about £20 million. That means that ways to make savings or increase income must be found. Councillors will make their decisions on the budget in February, but would like your views on what your budget priorities are to inform these decisions and to ensure that what matters most to the local people is considered. Council leader Gordon Lowe is encouraging residents to have their say. Councillor Lowe said, It is important that we hear from local people so that their opinions and priorities can inform the decisions we make to help us close the budget gap. We can be under no illusions. The public sector is under tremendous pressures, so setting a balanced budget for 2024-25 will be difficult. There are six key areas we are inviting people to share their views. Cost of living support, climate emergency, fees and charges, council tax, income generation and savings. In economic times that are so challenging for individuals, families, businesses and organisations, we want to focus on what matters most to our residents. This is especially important given the difficult decisions we are likely to face. We would like to encourage as many people as possible to complete our survey. As a thank you, we have five food store vouchers to give away and everyone who submits a survey form and includes their details will be entered into a draw to win one. The consultation is now live and will run until November the 3rd. The survey can be found on the consultation webpage www.easternbarton.gov.uk slash your hyphen budget hyphen priorities. Potter Stamps Royal Mail in partnership with Warner Brothers revealed images of 16 special stamps being issued to pay homage to the Harry Potter film series. The main set of 10 stamps feature atmospheric images of characters. Each stamp has a secondary scene or character incorporated into the design and in addition the first font used for the value of the stamps replicates that of the iconic typeface used for the films. A further six stamps presented in a miniature sheet feature illustrations of the fascinating creatures and beings of the wizarding world. From Aragog the Acromantula, to the beloved house elf Doby. The full set also includes Harry's beloved owl Hedwig, Fox the Phoenix, Buckbeak the Hippogriff and Hermione's cat Crookshanks. Family Announcements Deaths Monroe Bill Peacefully on October the 5th 2023 Beloved Husband of the Late Vi a much-loved dad and grandfather. Funeral service will take place on Saturday, October the 21st, 2023 at Daldawi Crematorium for 10am. Helping yourself and others in times of grief. Emotional responses to loss include numbness, sadness and anger. Grief affects us all at one time or another in our lives whether it be due to the death of a loved one or some other form of loss. 
It is a normal emotion we feel as a response to loss, says Claire Collins, a bereavement coordinator with Marie Curie, www.mariecurie.org.uk. Throughout our lives, we experience many different types of loss, such as relationship breakdowns, redundancy, financial, health and de- the death of a loved one. These losses can often lead to a further series of losses. What are the common symptoms of grief? Many symptoms of grief can be experienced after the loss of a loved one, says Claire. The emotional responses include shock, numbness, denial, isolation, loneliness, sadness, anger, despair, emptiness, helplessness, fear and anxiety. We cannot see these emotions but there may be more obvious physical symptoms such as disrupted sleep, sleeping more or inability to sleep, loss of appetite, tearfulness, lethargy, panic attacks, increased susceptibility to colds and illness. These responses do not to loss are normal and do not last forever. Our social context can also be affected as social circles may change, finances and housing may be up impacted by the loss. Spiritually, we may experience a crisis in faith or a struggle to find meaning, both a meaning in life and a meaning in death. Does everyone experience grief in the same way? No is the answer, says Claire. Grief is completely unique to each individual. Everyone grieves differently, even within one family or a couple, a fact we can have an impact on relationships. There is no right way or wrong way to grieve, no set pattern and no set time frame. Its symptoms change as we learn to live without the person who has died. Sometimes, grief can be complicated due to historical losses, difficult relationships with the deceased or the circumstances of the death, for example sudden death, death after a long illness, suicide or murder. Migration and leaving behind their country of origin can also involve the losses of family and friends, history and cultural heritage and this can also impact on our grieving process. What are the common stages of grief? Much has been written about the stages or tasks of grief by researchers such as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Colin Murray-Parks and J. William Warden, says Claire. They speak about how the loss of a loved one is often followed by the feelings of shock, denial and numbness which can move into an acceptance of the loss as we get back into life's daily activities such as work, social circles and meeting new people. Life gradually becomes fuller and we are able to think fondly about our loved ones without becoming overwhelmed by grief. What are the common misconceptions about grief? People sometimes feel that the bereaved should be over it or moving on after a few weeks or months, but there is no set time for grieving, says Claire. There is no magic wand that can take the pain away. It takes time, and we can feel as if we are literally going mad with grief. This is normal. People experience grief in their own unique way, adults and children, men and women, and it also is important that we acknowledge everyone's grief, including people with learning disabilities or sufferers of dementia. Further information is available from the Palliative Care of People with Learning Disabilities Network at www.pcpld.org. Have you tips for someone experiencing grief? When you're experiencing a bereavement, it's important you look after yourself and eat regularly, says Claire. Try to get out and take some physical exercise if you can. Also, Try to make some space and time for yourself and to remember your loved one. Plus, remember grieving is normal. Give yourself time as, you, as your grief will change. If you're struggling to cope with your feelings, seek further help. Talk to your GP or friends and family who could find, could find assistance for you if needed. What are the main differences between grief and depression? The symptoms of grief mentioned above may be similar to those of of depression, says Claire. However, depression usually results to a more constant state, whereas grieving is triggered by memories and reminders of a loved one. There are good days and bad days, 
when we're grieving and eventually th these bad days can become bad moments. Wednesday the 18th of October, Let's Talk, this week's letters page. If you have any letters, send them via email to kirkyherald at jnscotland.co.uk and write letters in the subject field. Please keep letters to a maximum of 300 words. If Financial Guru says Scotland can make it on its own, Sir, Scotland is rich. Scotland can perfectly well afford to go independent. These are the words of the Director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson, from his book, Follow the Money. Johnson is well respected by governments, the go-to financial guru for the BBC, and a regular columnist for the Times. His credentials are impeccable, and he seems trustworthy, a rare quality in today's world of lies and half-truths. So I believe him when he states that Scotland has the resources to become a rich nation in its own right. I believe him when he refers to the Scottish desire for an equal society, unfettered by schooling, income or parentage, and having different aspirations from south of the border. I believe him most of all that when the latest September stats in terms of private sector economy put Scotland at number two out of the 12 nations and regions of the UK. That was his precise point. Economically, Scotland is always in the top third. Of course it can afford to be independent. Yours etc. Francis Scott by email. Lost the sheep flock back to the labour fold. Sir, there seems to be a lot of excited politicians around just now about the local election resulting in Rutherglen and Hamilton West. Having knowledge of this particular constituency, I can tell you the result was no surprise. I'm of an age that can remember this area was always a Labour voting area and that, that only changed when Scottish Labour lost its way and the voters of this constituency, rather than give their vote to Scottish Liberals or Conservatives, opted to vote SNP. This is probably the same in a lot of other Scottish constituencies. Anybody who would like to dispute this needs to look no further than the 2014 referendum result where SNP voters must have voted to remain in the UK, hence the result. The SNP are on the decline not just because of their failure to make Scotland a better place to live and their own internal troubles. It's because Scottish Labour seem to be getting their act together and saying the right things to voters want to hear. Whether they deliver them or not is for another day. So, come the next general election, I fully expect Scottish Labour to regain most of their lost sheep. Yours etc. J Moore, address supplied. Candy Floss Society Sir, the two-party political system is useless as both blindly promised economic growth and the provision of better public services and infrastructure. The reality is, for as long as anyone can remember, we have been living like spoiled teenagers having an endless thrash in a big house that is falling apart from neglect. A kind of candy floss society ignoring reality, while the debt incurred by our enjoyment has risen from £350 billion in 1997 to £2,800 billion today, much of it spent in things we don't really need, and most of them imported. Economic growth in the form of profit from selling manufactured goods abroad has almost stopped, to be replaced by borrowing magic money printed to maintain an illusion of prosperity. But this could be over if we can't afford to pay the rising interest charged by the magic money printers. Unless some real money is made, the thrash in the big house must end, and its much needed repair will not be possible, and will be camping out in the equally neglected garden. Yours etc. Malcolm Parkin, by email. It's all over, sir. There is only one thing preventing Scotland from breaking away from the others in this island. No matter how it may be inter interpreted by the national side, a Scotland being held in some of a some kind of a absurd colonial lock by Westminster or the Tories or MI5, Scotland remains an integral part of the UK because the majority of Scots want it that way. Most notably, this was shown in the once in a lifetime referendum in 2014, but time and time again, that wish is reiterated. The problem for the Nationals is that, in their efforts to turn the majority 
they become more and more extreme and as much as logic and reason and a believable and non-fantasy economic cases are abandoned instead they organise another march in flag-waving bonanza and make personal attacks on those they disagree with and so the very people they need to come over to their side are turned off even more it is all over I'm afraid yours etc Alexander Mackay address supplied MSP applauds the charity's work. A charity based at Kirkintilla, which strives to ensure disabled people and those with chronic conditions have the opportunity of a fulfilling working life, has been praised by the local MSP. Strathkelvin and Bearsden SNP MSP, Rona Mackay, paid a visit to the Scottish Union of Supported Employment, SUSE, at Nisham Drive to learn more about their work recently. The aim of the SUSE is to support disabled people to find and retain paid work by increasing the availability and quality of supported employment in Scotland. Next month, SUSE is hosting Inclusive Employers Week Scotland, a week of activities from November the 13th to 17th to help employers discover more about the support available to them to recruit and retain disabled talent. Local firms can take part in a week of bite-sized online information sessions and training Ms Mackay said it was a fantastic visit to the Scottish Union of Supported Employment at Kirkintilloch to hear about its vital work promoting inclusion and diversity in the workforce. It's so important disabled people and those with long-term health conditions have the opportunity of a fulfilling working life. SUSE was shortlisted this year for the Digital Citizen Award at the SCVO Scottish Charity Awards 2023. A spokesperson for SUSE said, Recruitment today is often digital, with many employers only accepting online applications. Disabled job seekers face not just attitude barriers, but digital barriers as well. Many websites are not fully accessible to disabled people. We educate employers on how they can have efficient and cost-effective recruitment processes that do not deter disabled or applicants with long-term health conditions. This, ultimately, provides confidence to disabled job seekers that barriers they typically face at the job application stage are not due to their level of digital skills, but rather a failing of recruitment processes. To find out more, visit suse.org.uk Be aware of uptick in insect activity. Expert at British Pest Control Association BPCA are encouraging householders to be vigilant against insect infestations after indications of increased activity this autumn. Members of the National Trade Body have reported a rise in flea infestations this year, highlighting concerns around possible resistance to shop-bought flea treatments. Tick populations in certain rural areas of the UK have also reportedly jumped in recent weeks, while autumn is also a key period for bed bugs activity as many hitchhike a ride home with holidaymakers. John Horsley, BPCA Technical Officer, said, Different pest problems require the use of specific techniques and products, so if you discover you have an unwanted guest, it is essential you establish what species it is before you take any action. Fleas can be carried into homes on pets, people or soft furnishings. Their bites can cause intense irritation and itching and may become infected and have been known to cause skin complaints and exacerbate respiratory illnesses. Thorough vacuum cleaning, washing clothes or pet bedding at 60 degrees C and do-it-yourself treatments can be effective. Bed bugs will hitch a ride into your home on clothes, luggage and furniture. They are notoriously difficult to treat, so it's best to contact a pest professional with the know-how to deal with them. If you discover a tick on yourself or your pet, get help from a GP or vet, a vet to remove it. Do-it-yourself removal can result in the tick's mouth being left in the wound. Ticks spread Lyme disease, which can, be a se- which can be serious if left untreated. If a rash appears, seek medical attention. 
For further information, visit https forward slash bpca.org.uk forward slash A to Z. Light up red to show veteran support. Poppy Scotland is calling on businesses, tourist destinations and landmarks across the country to light up red to raise awareness of the 2023 Scottish Poppy Appeal. From castles to council buildings, schools to statues, the charity is urging some of Scotland's most iconic buildings to show their support in the lead up to the Remembrance Sunday on November the 13th. Last year, 188 locations took part from Stornoway to Selkirk, including the House of Brewer, Island Doran Castle, the Caird Hall, Glasgow Science Centre and the Edinburgh Castle. The charity is calling for mass involvement to surpass this total in 2023. Any building with external lighting can take part, simply by adding red gel filters to their lights to join in this very visual representation of remembrance. Previous locations include castles, abbeys, war memorials, bridges, lighthouses, cranes and fountains. The Scottish Poppy Appeal is Scotland's biggest fundraising campaign, raising more than £2 million for the charity's welfare work with veterans, servicemen and women and their families. Three million poppies are on their journey around the country including 400,000 new plastic-free poppies. Austin Hardy, Poppy Scotland director, said, It is always special to see so many iconic Scottish landmarks lighting up red in support of the Scottish Poppy Appeal. We know how much this act of remembrance means to our armed forces community, and the visual support across so many instantly recognisable landmarks shows how valued our armed forces community is here. For more details, visit www dot poppy scotland dot org dot uk slash light hyphen up hyphen red schoolgirl pen's christmas book a new book written by a scottish girl when she was just six years old is set to become a christmas classic santa steals christmas also aims to change the way books are published so all children can enjoy the magic of reading even their magnate is thought to be Scotland's youngest published author. Now 14, she produced a book in partnership with leading charities, so its design and format are accessible to children and families with neurodiversity and sensory loss. The book, illustrated by renowned illustrator Nicholas Child, tells the story of Santa and his band of helpers seeking to unmask an imposter who has stolen the world's Christmas presents. It has been supported and developed in partnership with charities including Dyslexia Scotland, Scottish Autism, Deaf Action and Fife-based sight loss charity Seascape, which all contributed knowledge and experience to the production of the picture book in different formats. It is available as a dyslexia-friendly paperback edition, enhanced audio description, British Sign Language version and four different types of Braille. Free copies are also being sent to schools and libraries, charities and hospitals, and a portion of the book's sale will be donated to each of the charities which help develop it. Eve, who is autistic, worked closely with the illustrator Nicholas Child to help visualise the story, including characters of different ethnicities and abilities. She started writing the story when her dad, Mark, when she was six, he typed it up to turn the original story into a book as a Christmas present for Eve and they later discussed publishing it to donate the book to primary schools in different accessible formats. Eventually, the pair decided to try and use her magical story to tackle exclusion in publishing. Eve, from Edinburgh, said, Books are important for imagination and no one should miss out on that. I really enjoyed working with Nicholas Child on the illustrations and helping him make the world I imagined come to life on the page. To buy a copy, visit www.santastealschristmas.com RSABI's £100,000 Fighting Flood Fund Scottish farming and crofting families who were seriously hit by last weekend's flooding are being encouraged to contact RSABI 
to apply for support via its flooding fund. The charity is offering payments of up to £1,000 per farming family business for those who experience the greatest loss as a result of the extreme rainfall. Farmers who sustain serious losses or damage are being encouraged to complete an online application forum on RSABI's website and social media platforms. The funding will be provided at RSABI's discretion to those who meet the eligibility criteria and are able to provide details and evidence of damage and losses. RSABI is also working with the team at Forage Aid to assess what demand there is for replacement bedding, feed and forage and the charity is asking farmers who have lost these supplies to email forageaid at rsabi.org.uk Wednesday the 18th of October District News Churches Cater Parish Church Beside the canal for full details please see our website We look forward to welcoming you this coming Sunday to our morning service which is at 10.30am in Cather Parish Church The service will be led by Reverend John McGregor and Probationer Minister Chris Gordon and Javier Jose Lucindo Malo, MMUS. All are welcome. Children meet in the church at 10.30am and then go to the hall for the activities. Tea and coffee served after the service. Food bank. If you wish to donate to the local food bank, you can bring your donations of food to the church or the coffee shop. Early Fellowship meets in the South Hall Chapel at 9.30am on Thursday for half an hour with Reverend John McGregor and also available on Tuesday and Thursday in Zoom. For further details, contact the Minister. Our coffee shop is open Tuesday to Thursday from 10am to 2pm and Friday the 10th to noon. 92nd Glasgow Company, The Girls Brigade, Tuesdays, Explorers, P1 to P3, 6.15 to 7.30pm, Juniors, P4 to P7, 6.30 to 8pm, Brigaders, S1 to S6, 7.30 to 9pm, 212th Boys Brigade, Anchor Boys, P1 to 3, Monday, 6 to 7 p.m. Junior section, P4 to 6. Monday, 7.15 to 8.30 p.m. Company slash senior section, P7 to S6. Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Church of God, at Regent Hall, Regent Street, every Wednesday, our coffee corner is open from noon to 2 p.m. for home baking and coffee. Join our friends and neighbours for a chat over coffee. On Sunday, there will be a Zoom service at 6.30pm. The speaker will be Stephen McCabe from Belfast. A warm invitation to everyone who is able to join us on Zoom. Access details for the stream can be obtained by emailing hello at signregenthall.org. For up-to-date and further information on our services, visit our website www the Bible says Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved Romans chapter 10 verse 13 St James On Saturday October the 21st being the third Saturday in the month Dads and Kids is held from 10.30am to noon and there's a great chance for dads with young children to get together around some banter bacon rolls and coffee while the kids play on Sunday, October the 22nd, there will be a Sunday club at 10.30am. There is a communion service at 11am on Thursday in the chapel and on Sunday, October the 22nd, in the chapel at 9am and 10.30am in the church. We will be celebrating harvest and bringing along donations for the food bank. Everyone is welcome to come along to any of the services. Do stay on for tea and coffee and fellowship afterwards. There are also other virtual services and groups. For up-to-date and video- further information, refer to our social media, Facebook, St James of Les Bishop Briggs, website, www.stjamesbishopbriggs.org.uk Lindsay Old Parish 
Sunday worship begins in the church at 11am. There is a Sunday school for children aged 3 years to P7 and focus for secondary pupils. A creche is available for children under 3. The quilt and craft group meet every Wednesday 10am to noon in the session room. Time out on Mondays is at 7.45pm in the church hall. Hilary Sneddon will be teaching the ladies first aid at home. Come along and find out more. Tuesday, October 17, come and sing. The Dementia Friendly Singing Group meets in the church hall, 1.15 to 2.45pm. Scottish Country Dancing every Thursday, 7.15 to 9.30pm. Come along for fun, fitness and friendship. You'll be made very welcome. Springfield, Cambridge. Morning worship on Sunday, October the 22nd will be conducted by Reverend Gordon Mackenzie in the sanctuary at 11am. The Sunday school will meet in room 2. Tea and coffee will be served in the Cameron Hall after morning worship. Come along and enjoy the fellowship. No collection is taken during the service, so donations can be made by placing them in the offering plates in the Hall of Fellowship as you enter or leave the building. Morning worship has also been live streamed on the Springfield Cambridge Church YouTube channel. A link to this can be found on the Springfield Cambridge Church website www.springfieldcambridge.org.uk and Facebook page where up-to-date information about events and church organisations can also be found. There will be no vestry hour on Wednesday, October 18th from 10 10 to 11am. There will be no short weekly service of worship in the Springfield Chapel on Wednesday, October 18th from 11.10 to 11.30am. Christmas cards for the Lodging House Mission will be in sale in the Hall of Fellowship from Sunday, October 22nd. Monetary donations will also be gratefully received to help offset the cost of providing meals. A taster session will take place for the Springfield Cambridge Festival Chorus, Ginger Sub Chorus, on Sunday, October the 22nd, from 12.30 to 1.30pm. Come along and enjoy the fun. Boys and girls is 7 to 13 are all welcome, no audition required and no fee. Please register your interest in advance with Catherine Taylor at Catherine J. Taylor at sign btinternet.com. Lindsay Union, Sunday worship on Sunday, October the 22nd at 11am will be led by Reverend Donald McLeod. There is tea and coffee in the new hall after the service. Young people are also welcome to Lighthouse and Bible Class. A live stream of the service is available on YouTube via our website. The meeting place opens for tea and coffee and home baking every Wednesday, 10am to noon in the New Hall. Everyone, from the very young to the young at heart, is welcome to attend, and we also have a good selection of greetings cards and second-hand books for sale. Youth Cafe is not on on Thursday, October 19th, Due to school holidays, the coffee pot is open on Fridays 10am till noon in the new hall for teas, coffee and chat. Art for Seniors is on Monday, October the 23rd, 1.30pm in the new hall. Enjoy creating a piece of art under the step-by-step guidance of, Rever- of artist Bev McCluskey. No experience needed. Contact Margaret on 077-921-68826. To book your place, that's Margaret on 07792 168 826. Home Church, Scotland, Lammermoor Road, Kirkintilloch, G66 2AB. Home Church, Kirkintilloch, Home Church East End, Carmyle G32 8DP. And online, a church for all ages. Blessed is a man who trusts in him. Psalm 34 verse 8 Sunday, October the 22nd, Communion, 9.30am to 10am Prayer meeting followed by refreshments, 11am to 12.30pm Worship service, Children's Church and Creche, followed by refreshments A warm welcome awaits you Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Bible studies and discussion groups in person and on Zoom Wednesday, Mothers and Babies, 10 to 11.30am. 
Fridays, Craft and Coffee, 10am to noon, open to the community. Youth Fellowship, 7.30 to 9pm, a varied programme. Home radio available every day. Sunday services at Home Church, East End, Carmyle, 10am and 6.30pm. See Facebook, Instagram and Home Church website for the latest information. Ken Muir, Sunday's morning worship at 11am will be led by John Anderson and Margaret Russell. Visitors can expect a warm welcome when they come along. Teas and coffees and a time of fellowship after the service. Our services are live streamed on YouTube. Find the channel by simply searching for Kim Muir Bishop Briggs. Details of all of our groups can be found on our website kimmuir-church.co.uk To find us on Facebook, just search for Kim Muir Parish Church. If you'd like to join our WhatsApp group or receive the Bible studies from ABC, then email us at kimyourchurch at at sign icloud.com. St Mary's The service this Sunday will begin at 11am as usual and be taken by the Reverend Dr Ruth Morrison. Here will be an age-appropriate activities for our young people in the halls during the service. The Monday craft group meet in the session house between 2pm and 4pm when they will continue with their preparations for Christmas. Wednesday welcome will take place on October the 25th from 10 to 11.30am where there will be a short service. Tea, coffee and home baking will be available during the morning. On Wednesday November the 1st our monthly open doors will take place from 10.30am until 3.30pm. Tea and coffee will be available during this time. Between 12.15 and 1pm there will be an organ recital when a selection of music pieces will be played by our church organist David Barnes. Tea and coffee will be available just prior to this recital and you are very welcome to bring your lunch with you. The Sacrament of Holy Communion will be celebrated on Sunday the 5th of November. Also on Sunday, November the 5th, tickets will be available after the service for the Advent lunch and the price this year will be £16. A Thanksgiving Thank You Colston Wellpark Church welcomes everyone to their morning service at 11am led by Reverend Malcolm Cuthbertson. Tea, coffee and conversation in the hall afterwards. A special thanks to all who contributed to our Harvest Thanksgiving service with all money and foodstuffs going to the Lodging House Mission and the Food Bank. This Monday, the Art Club continues from 10am to 1pm. Don't forget... This Wednesday, our tea break is on from 11am till 12.30pm, where you can meet new friends. The food bank is open from 11am till 1pm and 2 till 4pm. A special thanks to all who assist in its running and organisation. Wednesday 18 October District News General Holyrood View Sunak's Environmental Crime Spree by Ross Greer MSP Rishi Sunak has been on the environmental equivalent of a crime spree. Firstly, the bizarre yet grim climate wrecking speech in which we announced that the UK government was ditching or delaying the already inadequate policies it previously adopted to tackle this global emergency and then the catastrophic decision to give the go-ahead to a massive new oil and gas field, Rosebank. With a stroke of his pen, Sunak signed off new emissions equivalent to the world's 28 poorest countries combined. The evidence of a climate disaster is all around us. More wildfires, floods and storms, record numbers of species lost, and people forced to flee their homes. What we do in the next few years will define life on this planet for centuries. Governments must show whose side they're on. Will they stick with the greedy corporations wrecking our planet? Or will they stand up for people and planet? Sunak's decision on Rosebank shows he's fully in the pocket of the same oil and gas companies making record profits with our household energy bills rise. One of the most misleading things we've heard from the Tories 
is the suggestion that climate action means people are having to suffer. The reality is it's their anti-green decisions which have resulted in everything from energy bills to food prices skyrocketing. Tackling the climate crisis will also create green jobs and make our homes easier and cheaper to heat. The Scottish Government, with limited powers and a far smaller budget than Westminster, are embracing the opportunities of a green economy. This month saw the launch of another Scottish Greens policy, the trial removal of peak time rail fares for six months. This will help the planet by making public transport more viable for thousands of commuters taking cars off the road every rush hour. It will also help make life more affordable for people. This goes hand in hand with our hugely successful rollout of free bus travel for under 22s. 12,499 young people in Eastern Bartonshire have taken 1,111,482 free journeys so far. Every pound saved in a commute is money that we can instead go towards heating, eating and other costs which can continue to rise as a result of Westminster's cost of living crisis. Is there a family for Freckles? Meet delightful three-year-old Staffy Cross Freckles, whose sweet, affectionate nature, nature shines when she's with the people she trusts. She has a heart full of love to share with her forever family. She's looking for experienced owners who have cared for nervous dogs before and a quiet, adult-only home. Her ideal environment includes no visiting children and no other pets. While she loves going for walks, Freckles prefers to take her time savouring the scents. A garden would be a lovely addition to her new home. If you think you could provide the right home, contact the West Calder Rehoming Centre on 01506 873 459. You can also follow Dogs Trust West Calder on Twitter and Instagram. Out of Town, Mulgai Music Club. November and December concerts include the Cult of Corelli with Marie Lawson, soprano. Miki Takahishi, violin. Christopher Suckling, baroque cello. Jan Waterfield, harpsichord. Four of Britain's leading interpreters of baroque music come together at Mulgai Music Club's next concert in Cairns Church on Friday, November the 10th, to celebrate the glorious music of the early 18th century composer Archangelo Corelli. Corelli's cult-like popularity across Europe made him a musical hero to younger composers like Handel and his music, especially his brilliant violin pieces, was incredibly influential. Led by Beersdenry's cellist Christopher Suckling, now a senior professor at London's Guildhall School of Music, the ensemble explores how Corelli's music inspired Handel and a host of other composers. With celebrated Scottish soprano Marie Lawson, the programme also features some stunning vocal music of the period and traces Corelli's influence all the way to Scotland, where his infectious Italian style mingled with songs and dance tunes from the folk tradition. The club's event on Friday December the 1st is entitled Musical Chairs and is a heartwarming seasonal celebration, a pre-Christmas party with tasty snacks and drinks. Hosted by the Music Hub, the club's highly successful new venture for amateur musicians, this informal evening is described as a musical mystery tour, unfolding through Cairns Church buildings with plenty of music, including some surprise musical guests, a quiz, and a chance to chat and meet new friends. For tickets, go to www.mogaimusic.org. That's www.milngaviemusic. .org, or in person from the Honeybee Cafe and at the venue on the night. General Retail Crime The Scottish Grocers Federation has called on the Scottish Government for an emergency plan to tackle the threatening surge in retail crime. Police Scotland's figures show there have been almost 8,000 cases of abuse and assaults of retail staff reported in the past two years. At a recent meeting of leaders Retail representatives, SGF received cross-sector reports of shop theft, having doubled in recent months, compared to the same period in 2022. Meanwhile, the Protection of Workers Retail Act, which was delivered with, with the support of SGF, came into force in August 2021. 
The latest figures provided by Police Scotland show that the Act has been used 7,955 times to report retail-specific cases of abuse or assault of staff and retailers. This information comes to light amidst a torrent of widespread shop theft, reports of staff resigning because they feared for their safety, and suspected losses worth millions of pounds to local businesses. SGF has contacted the Scottish Government, the Lord Advocate, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and the Courts and Tribunal Service, calling for the figures and convictions relating to the Protection of Workers Act to be made public. This is essential information to show the Act is a working deterrent. However, despite figures showing that over 2,600 cases have been referred to the Fiscal, none of these public bodies have been able to provide, or even hold, the relevant data on convictions. Chief Executive Dr Pete Chima, OBE, told the SGF Annual Conference, It is time for ministers to stop sitting on their hands and put together a meaningful plan of action to tackle the tsunami of retail crime. It is not only shop windows that have been shattered, but people's lives, their livelihoods, their health and their mental well-being. Sport. Speedway. Tigers win title. Glasgow Tigers boss Cammy Brown vowed this is for our fans after his side won the Cab Direct Championship League title last week. The Tigers produced a powerful powerhouse 52-38 win over the defending champions Pool Pirates in the grand final first leg at Ashfield and while they lost the second leg 47-43 in Dorset it was enough to claim a 95-85 victory on aggregate. Chris Harris won the SGB Premiership with Pool in 2018 the same season he was knocked out in the Championship Playoff semi-finals with Tigers and was sensational against his old side. He would ride to, p- to a paid maximum in the first leg and then conceded his only point of the second leg in the final race of the night with the result being academic by that stage. Harris said, It's a very special feeling to win it at pool and also an incredible feat. They've won so many trophies. It's been fantastic working with these guys all season. I can't speak more highly of this bunch of lads. Everyone chipped in all season to make this possible, including the likes of Marcin Novak and Klaus Vissing. I said from the start of the season that I owed Glasgow a big season after the disappointment of 2018. I hope I've managed to do that. Tigers went into the second leg with a target of 39 points to win the title, and had they reached that with two races left, as it ended their run of being the losing finalists in two of the last three seasons. Brown said, It was an incredible display from all the boys, and Chris was exceptional, dropping only one point. I can't explain how much this means for the club, the Fasena family owners, and the fans. We've waited 12 years for this moment, and to get the result against the mighty Pool Pirates is just out of this world. I'm so proud of every single one of the team, the backroom staff, and the volunteers. This was the best performance from a Glasgow team I can remember for a very long time. It's a moment of history. Every rider rolled out of their skin. They stopped pull all night and didn't give them a sniff of clawing back the deficit we opened up at Ashfield. City have mountain to climb in the second leg. Glasgow City have a mountain to climb when they take to the pitch in Norway tonight, Wednesday, to keep their Champions League campaign alive. City lost 4 0 to Bran in the first leg of their second round tie at Peters Hill Park last midweek. The visitors took the lead after five minutes when Rakal Injevic rounded Lee Gibson and doubled their advantage eight minutes later as Justine Keelan fired home from just outside the box. Injevic grabbed her second in 39 minutes before Brenna Lovera was denied at the near post as City went in three down on the, at the break. The home side were much improved in the second half and Aurora Mickelson had, had, a good, had to show good reactions from a deflective Amy Muir cross with Lovera lurking. Charlotte Wardlaw and Kenzie Weir went close from corners but their task was made all the tougher when Marit Lind made it 4-0 with 4 minutes left in the clock. Muir told the club's media team that City were very much the architects of their own downfall. She said... We got closer and competed better in the second half, but the first half was just not what we were about. We let them on top of us too easily, so that's disappointing. 
but we still have a second leg and want to show ourselves better. Losing the two early goals gives them momentum and it's frustrating, but a lot of it has come from our errors. It is all preventable things which are more frustrating, but hopefully we'll be in a better position when we face them again. We just need to ignore the scoreline, go with the mentality we want to win the game and impose ourselves a bit more. It was back to league action on Sunday, a City came from behind as they won 3-2 away to Aberdeen. Brenna Oliveira gave City the lead in the 24th minute, only for the home side to turn the game around as Eva Thompson equalised in the first half stoppage time. Then, Hannah Stewart put them ahead two minutes after the break. However, Aberdeen were only in front for three minutes as Laverna grabbed her second to level and a minute later, Kingsa Koza kicked the winner. After their trip to Norway, it is a visit of Montrose in the league on Sunday. Sides through to next round with more cup action ahead. Kirk and Teller of Rob Roy took revenge in Hurlford United to reach the next round of the South Region Challenge Cup. Rob Roy lost 5-2 when they visited United in the league two weeks before, but on the return to Ayrshire on Saturday, a Michael Baber goal was enough to win the third round tie. Meanwhile, the squad has been boosted by the arrival of ex-Queen's Park midfielder Max Gillis and former Forfra Athletic and Motherwell defender Yusuf Hussein. Astrid are also through after a 4-3 win away to Creetown with an excellent comeback. Trailing 3-1 midway through the second half, Bobby Barr grabbed his second of the match before a Sean Doherty header equalised and an own goal won it for Ashfield. Peter Hill's trip to Camp Cambusland Rangers in the WOS West of Scotland, First Division, was abandoned on Saturday, with the away side 2-0 up after a home player suffered a serious injury that required an ambulance to be called. Caledonian locomotives made it four wins in a row in all competitions as they beat Glasgow University 3-1 at home in the second division, with John Kelly, Lewis Guy and Conor McIntyre all on target in the first half, but in the same league, Glasgow Persia went down 2-0 away to Lark Hall Thistle. Rossville were unable to exact revenge for the defeat in the opening day of the campaign as they lost 3-1 away to Eglinton in the fourth division. There is more cup action on Saturday in the West of Scotland Cup, although some teams are at different stages of the competition. In the second round, Rob Roy travelled to Solcoats, Victoria, Peter Hill post Pollock, Kayleigh Locos head to St Caddox, West Park United welcome Vale of Clyde, and Rossville are at Giffnick, while, in the first round, Ashfield are away to Craigmark Burntonians, and Shire make, up the, make the trip to Cambus Lion Rangers, Rossville women remain in pole position for promotion to the SWPL 2 after a 4-1 win at home to second placed Air United on Sunday. Louise Cameron put the visitors in front in the third minute, but Rossville countered quickly with goals from Jim and McQuillan and Lindsay Holmes within the first 10 minutes. McQuillan grabbed her second strike after the break and a late strike by Tina Hill wrapped the game up. That concludes this week's edition of the Kristen Village Herald podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.